Hey guys, it's me again, Zoe, and welcome to the start of my new series, which is Med Topics Review. So Med Topics Review will basically function as an audio question bank, wherein I'll be reading different case-based questions, I'll be reading out the choices, and telling the answer and the rationalization behind the answers. I'll also add a personal touch, which my friend suggested, which is to show how I approach the different questions and how I analyze them and what I do to derive at a correct answer. Or maybe what do I do when I'm studying so that I can prepare myself for these type of questions. Now, this video, I was given permission by Boards and Beyond and Ambo, so I'm grateful for their permission that they allowed me to use their resources to make this series. Hopefully now that with this audio question bank, you can be cleaning, exercising, or playing fishing on WoW, and you can just listen to me talk and at the same time review. So hopefully it'll be helpful, not just for me and my friends, but for other medical students out there. For our first question, we have biochemistry. A one-year-old male infant presents with a history of recurrent upper respiratory infections, failure to thrive, and anemia. Vital signs are temperature, 98.8 Fahrenheit, blood pressure, 110 over 70, heart rate, 135 per minute, and respiratory rate, 30 per minute. For the past month, he has been taking pyridoxine, folate, and cobalamin supplements without improvement. Further workup reveals excess urinary erotic acid. A blood smear reveals hypersegmented neutrophils. Deficiency of which of the following enzymes is most likely responsible for this patient's underlying condition? A. Ornithine transcarb amylase. B. Hyposantine guanine phosphoribosyl transferase. C. Uridine monophosphate synthase. D. Pyruvate kinase. E pyruvate dehydrogenase. The answer is C, uridine monophosphate synthase. So now let's talk about the rationalization behind the answer. So UMP synthase deficiency, also called erotic aciduria, presents in infancy with failure to thrive, recurrent infections, and megaloblastic anemia. Now, I'm pretty sure most of us, when we see megaloblastic anemia, we automatically think about vitamin deficiencies, probably vitamin B12 and B9. But here in the case, we already saw that the patient did take vitamin supplements. However, there was no improvements. So that is not the case. Here, we already see the trigger word, like keyword, excess urinary erotic acid. So that already leads you to think that there's something wrong with the metabolic pathway. But... There are two possible deficiencies that present with excess urinary erotic acid. That's UMP synthase deficiency and letter A, ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. Now, this is why I think as a tip, it's very important to compare and contrast deficiencies, especially if they have similarities. So we know that, okay, their similarity is they both have excess erotic acid. So now what makes them different? So UMP synthase, as mentioned, presents with megaloblastic anemia. OTC deficiency does not. There's no remarkable features in the blood smear. In fact, what's remarkable, these patients who are deficient, they actually present with hyperammonemia. So maybe in their BUN, you'd see that it would decrease. But here in our case, there was nothing mentioned about that. In fact, you can assume that since it wasn't mentioned that the patient has normal ammonia levels. So that's why we eliminate that as the answer. So in studying biochemistry, it's going to be a little bit overwhelming to memorize all those metabolic pathways. What I found helpful for me is when I try to recognize which enzymes are associated with different diseases and different drugs. And if it was a drug associated with that enzyme, what was that disease that was trying to be controlled? So for our case, we have a deficiency in an enzyme. So here also, there will always be a substance that is in excess and a substance that would have been decreased. In our case, UMP synthase deficiency, as mentioned, erotic acid was in excess. What would have been decreased is the UMP levels. And that is why to treat these patients with this deficiency, they are given uridine supplementation because uridine can be converted to uridine monophosphate 
and it will bypass the defective enzyme. So when you're studying, it's really important to recognize these relationships, which enzymes may overlap with other enzymes, which enzymes have maybe the same in excess or the same would have been decreased if they were gone. And when you make these relationships and connections, you compare and contrast, you're encouraging your brain to work more, to build connections. And in the end, I think as I've studied and I've felt an experience that it helped me really memorize things better and recall things better when I'm taking an exam. Next question, anatomy. A 71-year-old man with a long-standing history of poorly controlled hypertension presents with tearing chest pain that radiates to the back. A transesophageal echocardiogram is performed. An ultrasound probe is advanced into the mid-esophagus. Which anatomic structure will be immediately posterior to the probe? A. Aorta B. Left ventricle C. Left atrium D. Right atrium E. Right ventricle The correct answer is A. Aorta. So what's the rationalization behind this question? So the symptoms of the patient are suggestive of aortic dissection. How so? By the key words, tearing chest pain that radiates to the back. When you read this, when you hear also knife-like pain that radiates to the back, you can already think of maybe it's aortic dissection. But how do you confirm that? It can be done by imaging the aorta with CT angiography or transesophageal echocardiography as mentioned in this case. And you can see that if you forget the anatomy, maybe you can get clues from the case itself. So if this patient has aortic dissection, like you try to ask logically, like what would they ask of me since they mentioned this case? Why would they mention this case anyway? There's no point if they're going to ask something completely unrelated. So when you see a case suggestive of aortic dissection, probably they're just asking you a question of its anatomic correlation. So the answer most likely would be aorta. I think a good tip is to really familiarize yourself with the different diagnostic tests or procedures and what are their anatomic correlations, such as maybe when you're auscultating, you should know which part of the heart are you auscultating when it's at the fourth intercostal space, just lateral to the sternum. Or also, if another case presents with performing transesophageal echocardiography, with someone who has, let's say, endocarditis, the anatomic correlation question might ask you what would be anterior to the probe. And anterior to the probe would have been the left atrium. And it's really helpful for this because they use this test to detect if there are cardiac valvular vegetations. So again, when you're studying, really try to picture things. It helps a lot. Next, physiology. A 25-year-old medical student presents with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Blood pressure is 100 over 70, and pulse is 110 per minute. One liter of normal saline is infused intravenously. Which of the following effects will the infusion have on left ventricle preload and total peripheral resistance, or TPR? So for the choices, A, decreased preload, decreased TPR. I will follow the same order, mentioning what happens to preload first and then TPR. Again, A, decreased, decreased, B, increased, increased, C, decreased, increased, D, increased, decreased, E, no change, increased, F, no change, decreased, G, increased, no change, H, decreased, no change. The correct answer is D, increased preload, decreased TPR. So to understand the answer, we need to understand what happened first. The patient experienced volume depletion through vomiting and diarrhea. In response to volume depletion, sympathetic nervous system activity is increased which then leads to vasoconstriction, which then leads to an increase in total peripheral resistance. At a normal range, an increase in TPR can help push blood into capillary beds that badly need blood perfusion. 
Now, with infusion of normal saline, more volume is added to the venous system. And then, that leads to an increase in venous return to the heart, which then increases preload. Since this infusion will try to bring the body's volume closer to normal, sympathetic nervous system activity will start to decrease, meaning less vasoconstriction and a decrease in TPR. So studying this can be a little bit overwhelming, but you really need to focus on what are these factors that affect these things such as preload and TPR. For preload, if you increase blood circulating volume, preload will increase. If veins become constricted, more blood will be forced into the heart, which then increases preload. And finally, if the heart rate becomes slower, there will be more time for filling, which then allows the volume to be increased and preload also increases. For TPR, just think, okay, if there's vasoconstriction, the vessel becomes narrower, so more resistance. So the opposite, with vasodilation, it becomes wider and TPR is decreased. All right, so those are all our questions for today. And if you like this video and you want me to pursue this series, please give this video a thumbs up. Also, if you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for me to improve this video series, please don't hesitate to comment down below. And yeah, if you haven't subscribed, please hit that subscribe button and join me in my journey towards becoming a doctor. All right, bye for now.